five, building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust, and it is the uh, depth uh, lift, uh, the backpack, which will uh, supply oxygen and uh, water. Actually, uh, beginning to look a little bigger now. Uh, I can see quite distinctly uh, some of the features uh, with the naked eye. Roger, Fred, we see it. Uh, the picture's coming through real good, and uh, your description is good. We see. Uh, Houston, we have a problem. Someone can ironically say such a phrase when they want to inform someone that they forgot their keys to their apartment, got on the wrong tram, or are running late to the airport due to a giant traffic jam indicated by their navigator. All of this is, of course, unpleasant. But for the person who first said this phrase, there was absolutely no time for jokes. The original phrase sounded like this. Okay, we've had a problem here. The phrase was spoken by John Swigert, an astronaut and member of an expedition after an explosion occurred on the spacecraft he was on with two other astronauts. What happened next doesn't match the calm tone of the familiar phrase at all. That's why it's horribly interesting to understand this story. What exploded there? Who survived and who didn't? It's a story about complete chaos that happened in the emptiness of space and the extraordinary display of teamwork and composure. Actually, I suppose you might have watched the 1995 movie with uh, Tom Hanks. However, the incident was so extraordinary that it's uh, immensely interesting to delve into it uh, in more detail. I apologize in advance, I'm only learning uh, to speak English. And I will be glad to hear your comments about which words uh, I need to improve. Greetings, Earthlings, this is Greg and let's start figuring it out. Interestingly, everything started with Yuri Gagarin. Actually, we could go back even further, but I won't be talking about the entire space race today. Let's focus on one of the most iconic events. On April 12, 1961, Gagarin became uh, the first person to travel to space. It was an incredible sensation and newspapers all around the world covered this story. For the US government, the USSR beating them in the space race was a big problem that needed fixing. This was something that US President John Kennedy talked about. To be sure. <laughs> to be sure we are behind and will be behind for some time in man flight. But we do not intend to stay behind and in this decade we shall make up and move ahead. A few months uh, before these events, during his election campaign, Kennedy promised to do whatever it takes to achieve space superiority over the Soviet Union. But then things uh, went to the opposite way. And a month later, uh, he presented a program for a moon landing. Apollo to Congress. A year later, at Rice University Stadium, he delivered the speech you just heard, making it clear that Americans needed to go to the moon because it was a difficult challenge and because the moon was there in principle. In short, it was decided that a human should land on the moon no later than uh, 1970, and significant funds were allocated for this. NASA needed to expand, so a space center was built in Houston, Texas, which included a mission control center, a lunar laboratory, a crew training center and uh, test facilities. The program was called Apollo and it was announced by Kennedy in a speech a year after the decision was made.
The rockets used for the moon landing were roughly the same, just gradually improved uh, over time. They consisted of two parts, the Saturn V rocket and the Apollo spacecraft. The total height was 110 meters, like a 36-story uh, building. The Saturn V rocket was the most powerful, heavy and large rocket created by humanity at that time, capable of putting the spacecraft into orbit. It was a three-stage rocket. The first stage burned 13 tons of fuel per second, accelerating the rocket to 2.7 km per second and lifting it to a height about uh, 70 km. After that, the first stage was discarded and fell into the ocean. The second stage was designed to accelerate the rocket even more and raise it to 185 km after which it was also discarded and fell into the Atlantic. The third stage of the rocket propelled the spacecraft into orbit and then onto a trajectory towards the moon. This means that the fuel from the third stage was enough for two launches. The first lasted 160 seconds to launch Apollo into Earth orbit and the second lasted 320 seconds to put it on the trajectory towards uh, the moon. With this, the Saturn V mission was completed and the rest of the journey to the Moon and back uh, depended entirely on Apollo. Moving on the Apollo spacecraft itself. It consisted of two compartments, the command module and the service module, as well as uh, the lunar model. The command module was located at the top, where the crew members were positioned and could control everything. The compartment had a sealed cabin with the life support systems for the crew, radio communication, control and navigation systems. It was naturally shielded and had multi-layered thermal uh, insulation. In the front, non-sealed part of the command module was a docking mechanism. The tunnel that connected the command module to the lunar model was used for the crew to trail back and forth. During preparation and launch, the atmosphere in the cabin consists of 60% oxygen and 40% nitrogen. During flight, this mixture was weighted and replaced with almost pure oxygen. Oxygen reserves were located in the Apollo service module. The service model was roughly in the middle, and astronauts uh, didn't have access to it, as it was uh, not designed for human habitation. It was also quite uh, cramped as everything was packed into the service model, including the propulsion system, control systems, fuel tanks, oxygen tanks and hydrogen tanks. There were also three power plants in which oxygen and hydrogen were mixed together to generate uh, electricity. Thus, oxygen was used both for breathing and for energy production. An emergency oxygen system was also provided, which was designed to automatically activate in the event of a cabin pressure loss, such as a breach caused by a meteorite. At maximum flow, astronauts had only 5 minutes to put on their suits or fix the leak. However, people exhale carbon dioxide, so the air was constantly circulated through CO2 filters and absorbents, which were uh, housed in several cassettes uh, designed to operate uh, for 24 hours uh, each. The lunar expedition required 20 cassettes. But the oxygen tanks had to contain oxygen in a supercritical state, where it was not yet a liquid, but no longer a gas. In other words, as much oxygen as possible had to be packed in, but liquid oxygen couldn't uh, be used in space. However, supercritical liquid oxygen had a drawback. In whitelessness, it could separate into liquid and gaseous parts, resulting in incorrect sensor readings. Therefore, the contents of the tanks had to be periodically mixed using special paddles in each tank to bring the sensor readings back to normal. The lunar model was completely autonomous. The engine was designed for multiple ignitions and had a lifespan of 1000 seconds to ensure landing on the moon, takeoff from it, orbit insertion and docking with Apollo back. The power supply was provided by six silver zinc batteries, designed to power all the lunar model's needs for three days. 
the life support system consisted of an atmosphere regeneration and purification unit, cabin pressure regulation systems and water circulation for astronauts. The participants of this lunar adventure later admitted that they understood the risks of such far-reaching flights to their crews, but never imagined that the worst could happen on Earth. Astronauts Roger Chaffee, Werdell Grissom and Edward White were preparing for the first manned expedition as part of Apollo, scheduled for February 21, uh, 1967. For Chaffee it was supposed to be his first spacewalk, while White was known for being the first American to perform an EVA. On January 27, just under a month before the expedition, the guys went for training. Initially both spacecraft and training models were supposed to be equipped with pure oxygen, as it was believed to reduce the load on the ship in the vacuum of space. The alternative was an oxygen-nitrogen mixture, but there had already been an incident with nitrogen leaking into a spacesuit system, causing the astronaut to lose consciousness. NASA didn't consider how pure oxygen could affect combustion, but the team members were concerned. They repeatedly complained that there were too many flammable objects in the cabin, including on their clothing such as nylon mesh on velcro fasteners. And they complained about this to the manager, Joseph Shea. They even made a joking portrait of him with the folded hands that read It's not that we don't trust you, Joe, but come on. Whether this applied to the equipment of the ship or not, it turned out to be quite symbolic. On that very day, they were uh, supposed to undergo a test in actual spacecraft, where a flight simulation was to take place. First Grissom smelled something strange, then there were some communication problems, and Grissom even remarked, how are we going to go to the moon if we can't communicate between neighboring buildings? And then, when communication was finally restored, a distressing call was heard. Fire. Of course, listening to the recording of the last minutes of these poor astronauts is quite terrifying. They couldn't be saved, the cabin door was not designed to open easily, and it took only 4 minutes to open it from the outside. Plus, the flame inside caused pressure, and the astronauts' bodies were simply fused into their spacesuits. The investigation showed that the cause of the fire was a spark from a short circuit, it was enough to instantly flash everything around. The launch of the first manned Apollo was postponed for a year and a half, because the situation made it clear that there were a lot of flaws left. So at the start they decided to use a nitrogen-oxygen mixture. All flammable items were replaced, new hatches uh, were developed that uh, would open outwards. Everything was also covered with uh, insulation and nylon was removed from the suits. Despite the fact that the astronauts never took off into space, their wives uh, insisted that they be considered full members of the expedition, and therefore this event is called Apollo 1. Although the first flight of the Apollo program took place a year earlier, the first launches were unmanned. The goal was to test the engines, check the separation of rocket parts, life support system and much more. Of course, there were some issues during the first missions. During the first mission, before Apollo 1, helium got into the engine combustion chamber, causing it to stop working after uh, 80 seconds. Also, a faulty wiring caused the command module to become uncontrollable. If NASA had wanted to win the space race so badly that they sent astronauts on their very first flights, it would have been very dangerous for them. After the next unmanned test went relatively well, they decided to launch a crew from Apollo 1. But as you know, that didn't work. So the next three flights were unmanned again. Eventually, the first crew flew in October 1968 on Apollo 7. 
The crew just performed tasks related to spacecraft control, such as uh, manual control and docking with the lunar module. The moon landing was uh, planned for later, although the next mission, Apollo 8, was much closer to the goal. They orbited the moon 10 times. Apollo 9 and 10 tested lunar models, but only Apollo 10 did it uh, more thoroughly, getting closer to the moon. This flight was considered a rehearsal. Interestingly, the fuel tank of the lunar model was only half filled to prevent the crew from becoming unexpected heroes. In July 1969, the landmark event for America and the world took place. The first human finally set foot on the moon. It was Neil Armstrong, a member of the Apollo 11 expedition. The goal was achieved and the United States celebrated its victory about the USSR. It seemed like history was over, but it was just the beginning. Inspired by this uh, triumph, NASA couldn't uh, stop and needed to continue exploring our satellite. In November of the same year, the Apollo 12 expedition was sent. During the launch, the rocket was struck by lightning twice. Despite the fact that the weather was known to be not ideal, however, cancelling the flight was not an option. Not only because uh, 300,000 people were watching, but also because the moon landing was planned in a specific spot near uh, Survivor 3, a device that had been sent to the moon several years before to collect soil with a probe. If the flight had been postponed, they wouldn't have been able to land in the right spot. However, most of the instruments uh, malfunctioned uh, due to a lightning strike, and warning light appeared. That's when John Iron, an electrical engineer, came to the rescue. He said three magic words. Try ACA to ax, which the team and astronauts uh, didn't fully understand, but they had no other choice. In short, he redirected the signal processing system to another power source, and everything started working. The mission was a success, and they brought back a lot of moon soil and memories. It seemed like the men had thought of everything and uh, done everything correctly to conquer the art of moon landing. But it wasn't over yet. On a beautiful April day, uh, specifically on April 11, James Lovell, Commander, John Swigert, Command Model Pilot, and Fred Hayes, Lunar Model Pilot, set off to the moon. The last two guys were going to the moon for the first time, while James Lovell had already orbited the moon 10 times during Apollo 8, so he was probably really looking forward to the landing. Symbolically, the rocket launch was scheduled for 13.13 pm. The launch went smoothly, except that the second stage uh, central engine unexpectedly uh, shut down two minutes early. But it didn't uh, affect anything, because the rocket had already gained enough speed and soon it was in orbit, only 300 meters above its intended altitude. At first, the press and especially television were not that interested in uh, what the astronauts uh, were going to do on the moon uh, yet again. Just like <laughs> now, actually. However, they had to reach a specific place on the moon, the Fra Maura crater. It's a massive uh, depression with the traces of basaltic lava. Although the crater is mostly destroyed since uh, volcanoes haven't uh, been active there for billions of years. But uh, to get there, they had to take a risky road. In the past, spacecraft uh, followed a trajectory that uh, would ensure that if uh, something went wrong during the flight, for example, if the engines uh, failed, the ship would still end up in the moon's gravitational field, orbit around it, and fly back in the opposite direction, ultimately returning to Earth without need for extra fuel. However, Apollo 13 had to travel on a hybrid trajectory, meaning they had to deviate from the safe road. This was done to ensure they would reach the crater when the sun was at a 45 degree angle, so they wouldn't burn up. In short, everything was carefully calculated. Roger, sounds good, and this is the crew of Apollo 13, wish everybody there a nice evening, and uh, we're just about ready to close out our 
connection of Aquarius and get back for a pleasant evening at Odyssey. Good night. Some time before the following shots were taken, Houston's monitors showed a high reading in the oxygen tank. But they decided it was nothing to worry about since the pressure and temperature were normal. So after the shooting was finished, Swigert was instructed to stir the liquids in all four oxygen tanks. He pressed a button and then a very frightening event occurred. At first, Captain James Lovell thought Fred Hayes was playing a joke when he heard a loud noise, similar to when Hayes had uh, caused a commotion by clapping during the opening of Prussian equalization valves. But this time it wasn't Hayes, and it wasn't just a noise, it was like shaking the ship as if it uh, were a plane in turbulence. Lovell knew it couldn't be turbulence. It had to be the worst fear of an astronaut. A meteorite had hit the lunar model. The crew frantically started closing the hatch to the connecting tunnel, but uh, soon realized that it wasn't a meteorite. It's especially interesting to put oneself in Swigert's shoes. Just imagine that you casually push a button and then there's an explosion. And not just anywhere, but on your own spaceship in space. From the beginning, neither mission control nor the crew knew what was uh, going on. And they just uh, pushed buttons, uh, checking every sensor they could. They noticed that the pressure in the oxygen tank number 2 dropped to zero, and two of the three fuel cells stopped receiving power. Plus, the spacecraft continued to shake. It was unclear where this uh, would lead if James uh, hadn't accidentally looked out of the window and seen some haze coming from the spacecraft. This is how they discovered that it was a gas leak that was uh, causing the reactive force that was shaking the spacecraft. And judging by the rapid decrease in pressure in oxygen tank number one, they knew where the gas was coming from. In addition, the only working fuel cell number two was producing less and less electricity. It has gotten to the point where the reserve oxygen tank in the command module had to be used to cover basic needs. It couldn't be allowed to run out because it was meant to for the astronauts to return to Earth so they quickly closed it off. The last remaining solution was to close the wells leading to the fuel cells where oxygen mixed with uh, hydrogen. Maybe the leak was there. This meant that the moon landing was definitely cancelled because the well system was not designed to be reopened. In other words, there would be uh, no way to get the energy needed to land on the moon. But even that didn't help. There was a uh, little time left, so they decided to use the lunar model as a lifeboat. After all, the model was completely autonomous. However, there was a problem. The lunar model was designed for two people and only had enough resources for uh, 56 hours. The situation was discussed at the Houston Control Center, where the phrase failure is not an option was uttered. Oxygen was leaking out of the spacecraft and energy was almost gone. The fuel situation was unclear, and the decision was whether to turn back to Earth and sacrifice most of the remaining fuel, or to take a longer road around the Moon with the minimal fuel consumption. The scientists uh, concluded that braking would require over 5 minutes of engine work, followed by turning the ship around and accelerating again, which uh, would uh, consume too much fuel. Moreover, the service model engine may not have uh, survived the accident, and the re-entry speed would be too high with uh, that road. Therefore, they decided not to take any risks. But if they had reached lunar orbit, the moon would have turned them around. Besides, they were already close enough. However, the journey would have taken four days. Therefore, they decided that the life support systems should be enough with a strict economy. They started orbiting the moon by igniting the engine for 30 seconds and uh, making a small correction.
as it turned out, there was enough oxygen, because uh, there was enough gas in the lunar model. There was also enough fuel. Fortunately, the tanks with uh, it were not damaged. However, there was only enough electricity for 75 hours of operation of the ship under nominal load. This was one of the problems they would uh, definitely face. They also had to limit themselves in water, because its uh, full expenditure threatened to overheat the electronics of the model. There were no calculations for such a long instrument operation, and cooling was based on water. Additionally, there were no carbon dioxide filters in the lunar model. As I mentioned at the very beginning, we exhale carbon dioxide and it needs to be disposed of. Part of the filter system consists of round lithium hydroxide uh, cartridges that actually absorb carbon dioxide. There were enough of these uh, cartridges in the command model, but they were square. However, connectors in the lunar model were round. No one expected such uh, situations where they would have to use the lunar model as a rescue shuttle. Houston specialists uh, had to think and uh, use all possible household engineering solutions. A hose from the spacesuits, a bag, a sock, and tape, an imaginable set for space rescue, but it all worked. They did not insert uh, the square cylinder into the round hole, but made a transition piece that connected the hole with the cylinder and the air system. The air was clean again, but this was only one of the problems. Due to the energy saving mode, the temperature in the model ranged from 0 to 5 degrees Celsius. They didn't have any down jackets, only tight, thin uh, jumpsuits. In addition, they drank very little water, consuming only 170 milliliters per day to conserve resources. Just like this, half of the cup per day. With uh, such thirst, cold and stress, they struggled to sleep and uh, could only manage 3 hours of sleep per day. They also couldn't throw anything out of the spacecraft to avoid creating unnecessary reactive forces, so they collected their urine in bags and stuck them to the walls of the ship. This resulted in some of the crew developing infections, such as Fred Hayes. However, making it back to Earth was not the end of their challenges. They couldn't land the lunar model because its walls were too thin and uh, would have burned up in the atmosphere. Instead, they had to use the command model, which was protected by a heat shield that prevented it from burning up upon re-entry. Unfortunately, during an emergency, the system automatically switched power from the fuel tanks to the batteries, which quickly ran out of charge, putting the mission at risk. It was also unclear whether the low temperatures had affected the telemetry system. In short, there were many problems, and it was unclear how they could be solved. But I didn't tell you about John Aaron who saved the computers on Apollo 12 for nothing, because he played one of crucial roles here too. When an explosion happened on the ship, it wasn't uh, his shift, but he was uh, called as a superhero to also help find a solution. He came up with uh, how to redirect the power system from the lunar model to the common model. Again, this was never done in practice, but there were no other options. Command module safely launched, which was simply a miracle for the crew. But that was uh, not all. Before landing, many operations had to be performed. It was uh, necessary to detach the service module, which uh, went uh, without any problems. When it appeared in the windows uh, slowly moving away, the crew could assess the scale of its damage for the first time. A whole panel was turned off. This added concern for both the astronauts and Houston, because the damage to the service model could affect on the heat shield of the command model. And even if there was a small crack, the crew was doomed. Then the lunar model was uh, detached. The cosmonauts later spoke about this uh, moment with uh, special sadness. 
what saved their lives and was their home during such emotionally significant days was now moving away, remaining forever in the cold open space. Actually not, but for the story. For a normal landing, the spacecraft had to enter the atmosphere at a certain angle. A too small angle, and the spacecraft will bounce off the atmosphere and there will be no return to Earth. A too large angle threatens a command module with burning to um, excessive heating during deceleration. The angle at which the spacecraft approached Earth was smaller than um, needed but still acceptable. Nevertheless, it made uh, everyone who was uh, watching, including those on live TV, very nervous. It should be mentioned that uh, at the beginning I said it wasn't so important uh, that there was a third moon landing, but the explosion made a lot of noise. On April 17, at uh, 1753, the Apollo 13 command model entered the atmosphere at a speed of 11,000 meters per second, faster than in any previous mission. At this speed, the temperature around the spacecraft increases to about 8,000 degrees due to aerodynamic heating. This is essentially plasma, which means it blocks radio signals. As a result, communication with the crew dramatically cuts off after entering the atmosphere. In previous Apollo missions, the silence lasted no more than 4 minutes. However, the Apollo 13 crew didn't regain contact for almost 6 minutes causing legendary anxiety. Despite all the concerns, the parachutes opened successfully and the crew landed in the Pacific Ocean 100 kilometers from the island of Samoa. Everyone survived. However, it was equally interesting to know what had happened, where did the explosion come from, and this is what happened. As you may have understood from the very beginning, the Moon program was overall prepared and implemented in a big rush. To speed up all processes around 2000 contractors and subcontractors were involved in the production of the Apollo spacecraft. Naturally, in such conditions, there were moments that simply went unnoticed during numerous uh, checks, tests and control stages. This is what happened with the oxygen tanks installed on Apollo 13. Five years before the accident, during the design stage, it was said that the fuel elements of Apollo should produce 28 volts of electricity. Therefore, the specification for the oxygen tank indicated a working voltage of 28 volts. During the development of the service model, they decided that Apollo would receive electricity from ground generators with a working voltage of 65 volts. They revised all of their specifications, but forgot to change the thermostat context to the new voltage. The thermostat monitored for overheating in the oxygen tank. The quality control didn't notice this oversight. Three years later, in 1968, the tanks were installed in the Apollo 10 model. But the specifications changed, so they decided to replace the old tanks with the new ones and upgrade the old ones for future use. During the removal of the tanks from Apollo 10, workers forgot to loosen one bolt. 
uh, causing the tanks uh, to drop back down. Although this was uh, documented, the tank was considered fixed and uh, used in Apollo 13. During testing they discovered that the oxygen tank was not draining properly and they concluded that the tank was damaged from the previous drop. They proposed using a heater to evaporate the liquid oxygen instead of delaying the launch. This oversight was uh, surprising given that every detail of a space mission must be carefully considered. Moreover, the ship captain had been warned about it. However, nobody knew that the contacts of the thermostat, designed for 28 volts, had welded in their own position due to the 65 volt tension. As a result, the tank heated up so much that it melted the Teflon insulation of the wires, reaching over 500 degrees Celsius. But nobody noticed it, because the tank was heavily insulated. During the pre-launch fueling of Apollo 13, 55 hours and 54 minutes into flight, John Swigert, following Mission Control's command, turned on the oxygen mixing systems in the tanks. Bare wires caused a short circuit in tank 2. The remaining Teflon insulation caught fire, ignition the oxygen and causing a rapid pressure increase that blew the top of the tank. Instantly the pressure in the service module section where the tanks were located skyrocketed. The model bulged and a whole sheet of its uh, covering tore off into space due to the stress caused by the compression explosion. The explosion was so intense that it also ruptured the seal of the first tank, causing a leak of remaining oxygen, which Lowell uh, noticed uh, through the window. In other words, he saw not the explosion itself, but the aftermath. By the way, speaking of which, I wanted to talk about this legendary phrase that sparked uh, the idea for this video. Why is it so famous? It's just uh, air traffic control communication, right? Maybe some invisible director or a real journalist emphasized it as the main dramatic moment and all the newspaper headlines uh, started with it in those days. Actually, no. As I mentioned, and uh, as surprising as it uh, may be, there was no wild excitement of tracking of the mission. Therefore, this uh, phrase was not even noticed by anyone but the director and screenwriters of the 1995 movie, which was made about these events, uh, spotted it in the footage. And of course, uh, they slightly altered uh, the phrase for artistic uh, purposes. Houston, we have a problem. And now we are using the movie version of the phrase when something doesn't go as planned. Not only was the phrase corrected, but also all the mistakes that led to the accident were fixed. An additional oxygen tank was installed in all subsequent Apollo missions, so that in case of repeat of the accident, they wouldn't have to run to the lunar model. An emergency battery was installed, so that if the fuel cells failed, there would be something to power the command module's uh, systems. The water supply was increased by 9 liters. In addition, the oxygen tanks themselves were significantly uh, modified, wiring sensors and emergency signaling system uh, were replaced. By the way, thanks to Apollo 13, all other missions uh, in this program went well in technical terms, and no other such force uh, major uh, situations arose in any um, of the expeditions. So, as strange as it may seem, the accident brought a lot of benefit. Firstly, it showed the weak points of the Apollos, which were fixed and nobody was hurt. Some valuable data was obtained as well. When the ship made its first trajectory correction to leave Earth orbit for the Moon, the third stage separated from it not towards Earth, but was directed straight to the Moon to the site of the Apollo 12 expedition, where seismometers had been attached in advance. After the stage hit the surface, the sensors transmitted the level of vibrations through a seismogram. Later, this helped to calculate the thickness of the lunar crust. So, 
the story in which a series of coincidences uh, caused by haste uh, led to a tragedy in which nobody died and a lot of benefits uh, were extracted. I think it's amazing. I hope you enjoyed it too. If so, I would be very grateful for your subscription and comment. I'm just starting to develop this channel, which is quite difficult for me, because I am not native speaker, I am only uh, learning English. So I will appreciate every like and comment. Take care.